Okay, I'm here with Vic Peters. Um, he's a former holacracy practitioner, and we were just going to chat a little bit about all things holacracy, adoption, and uh, that type of thing. So, um, Vic, do you want to introduce, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Vic Peters. Uh, I used holacracy for a couple of years um, before my organization moved on to something else. And uh, I am looking for more uh, opportunities to experience holacracy and help other people to do so. Yeah, that makes sense to me. We, uh, we met through the holacracy community of practice and just started commenting on each other's stuff. Um, and so that's why we're sitting here today. So it's cool that you've like, uh, obviously internalized it and saw something in it and want to, want to, um, want to have more of it. Um, I imagine it could be frustrating to be, to be working with an organization that, that tries to adopt and then stops. Um, what was that like for you? That was frustrating. Um, it was, uh, it's a lot of, a lot of value, um, that I could see that we were not quite getting. Um, and eventually everyone else kind of perceived that too. And that's kind of how it started uh, to decline. Um, I think that it's really important to, to, to get clear about what value you want out of it. Um, and then focus on uh, getting clear about whether you're getting that. Uh, because if you focus on the processes and and, and ceremonies, um, but sort of uh, forget about what the, the goal is, um, it can be hard to really recognize the value you're getting and continue getting it. That's really interesting. And I'm just gonna take some notes here. Um, something I'm thinking about as I work with clients that are doing self-management is um, avoiding pitfalls like that. So this idea of uh, focusing on process and, and ceremony over the, the real benefits. You, um, and I, I, I totally get the idea of doing kind of like a uh, holacracy theater, like, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing the meetings, but, but power itself really isn't shifting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, um, like I, I, I read uh, reinventing organizations and it talked about uh, power is not zero sum, but, what I realized is at the beginning, it kind of is that uh, if people simply step up and exert their power, but then somebody who has implicit power uh, decides to overrule them, it just happens. And then yeah. people realize that the, the power they were trying to exercise was fake and that hurts real bad. Yeah. And this shift is such a fundamental thing and it's so intense. Like it's so intense isn't the word, but it's, it's in holacracy. It's such a, um, a fundamental power shift. And yet it is so foreign. Mm -hmm. um, how do we help people? How do we help lead? Like, so like in your case, I imagine that somebody thought it was a good idea to do holacracy in the first place. Mm -hmm. How was it, how was it pitched to you or how was it communicated in the, in the organization? Um, it was communicated that this is the sort of the tool we are going to use so that we can scale effectively. Um, because, uh, there was some challenges with communications and there was some challenges with, with, uh, alignment, <clears throat> And uh, we are a company that really emphasizes culture and sort of all of these things were going through growing pains. And we thought if we want to get to the next level, we need to do something so that we can uh, sort of align and, and uh, create clarity and really leverage what we've got and uh, reinforce the culture and keep it moving forwards and up. And you're, you're primarily in a, in a development role, software development? Uh, yes. So, so I'm also a software developer and I know that like, um, one of the great things about being a developer is that it's pretty clear what you're expected to do. Like, mm -hmm. Hey, look, here's a backlog. Let's take some stories off the backlog. Let's write some code. Let's yep. do, some, let's get, get, get them through QA. Let's get them into source control. Let's yep. deploy them to production. So I can see how, I can see how for a developer, it's kind of like, 
I don't even know if I need this thing because I know what I'm doing. Oh, well, that's an excellent point. Um, Cause like we're, we're a software company. So like 70% of the people are developers and already we're using agile and we're familiar with those processes. Um, but when we were rolling it out, uh, we didn't really take that into account uh, so much. And so we were rolling it out as though to a, uh, a, a company that wasn't familiar with agile. And so the problem with that is that the two clashed. Um, the, the amount of overlap between the two is so high. And so people were already uh, processing their content in the agile meetings. And then when the tactical came, there was a really a big challenge. Like, what do we talk about here? What's yeah. left? I've actually, I had that too at, uh, at Holacracy One. Um, obviously we're doing Holacracy and we're also developing software. And so we would, yeah, we would have tacticals and there was some question for what, at one point we, we sort of did like a sprint review as a, um, as an item in the tactical, like, you know, the, the scrum master role would, would bring a, uh, an item to triage and we would spend about 10, 15 minutes just going through the backlog and saying, you know, where's this at? What are the updates? Anything stopping you? Um, and that was, that was a sort of a way to, to kind of take agile or take scrum processes and, and kind of put them inside of the tactical format. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, and that worked, that worked fairly well at a certain point we actually broke out the development circle from the overall uh, glass frog circle, the technical circle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so we had a, we had a glass frog web circle that was, that, that was primarily concerned with technical issues. And then we had the circle that contained customer support and billing and more product type work, UX type work. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's a good way to approach it. Um, another way to approach it is to uh, explore the things that we're really good at in, in our uh, agile ceremonies is project work. It's all about project work. Um, but what tacticals have that you don't find in the other ceremonies is checklists and metrics. And uh, those sort of capture not the, uh, not the ongoing or ta tacticals or yeah, checklists and metrics help you capture the ongoing uh, related uh, expectations, um, whereas projects are more targeted at the one-time things. So I think that is, that is a little bit of a gap that we can capitalize on, is what are the ongoing expectations? For instance, um, do I feel like I am, have anything, or did anything go wrong this week? That's something that you might explore in a retro um, it actually has a lot in common with the retro, uh, but you can get really clear about what, uh, what questions you're asking to figure out what is worth talking about. Are you, are you suggesting having a checklist item? Did anything go wrong? Check or no check? Yes, I like that. Um, as a starting point, I would expect you would not stop there, but that is a starting point, then you evolve from there and then talk about things that have gone wrong in past months or years and ask if those things went wrong. Yeah, interesting. Um, um, you can also explore uh, relational things like this external team that we have a relationship with, uh, they didn't create a bad experience for me. That's, that's another thing you can explore. So um, experiential metrics or experiential it's kind of like checklist items. And then also I could even imagine doing a metric like, uh, you know, what, what's your experience of the efficacy of communication with the external team one to five? Yes. So ways to get kind of like a heartbeat or a, maybe it's not the right word, but like a um, kind of getting your finger on the pulse of people's experience as sensors in the organization uh, of various aspects. So was that something that was lacking or something that you just like, cause I've, I've heard that I saw, I saw you mention this idea on the community practice once. Um, is this like sort of your own invention or something that you noticed would, would, be, would have been useful when you were practicing? It's something I would have liked to see um, by the time I sort of like my, my thinking evolved over time. And by the time my thinking evolved to the point where I realized this would be valuable at the organization had gotten to the point where it was, there wasn't appetite anymore. Yeah. Um, so I would have liked to have acted on it uh, while the time was right. 
and now that you're um, sort of back to doing traditional agile, agile, is it more agile scrum or, or agile Kanban? Um, I'd say that uh, where we are right now is ambiguous. Um, but I think we are generally moving towards uh, our own variant of self-management, uh, sort of an in-house version. That sounds somewhat promising. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about it? Uh, I can't really, um, because I don't yet know what it is. <laughs> um, I'm still waiting for that information to be released. Um, hmm. I think that it's in order for it to not uh, experience the same pitfalls that we experienced with Holacracy, I think there's a, a lot of things that we're going to have to reflect on in order to recognize uh, what we could do better because I think all of the same hurdles that hindered us from achieving Holacracy are still going to be present. They didn't get resolved. And so anything we do in the future is going to have to have a plan to deal with the things that hindered us in the past. And are those are those things sort of issues currently, like with the with the management hierarchy or with the, the current system? Um, I would say, I think so. Um, like to take one example, uh, is is the idea that Leadlink is a uh, unidirectional um, membrane is is pretty important to Holacracy. Um, and replink represents the other direction. And then those two can work together to, uh, well, basically resolve a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, what, what the core there is, is that those within the team need to have an escalation path that doesn't go through that lead. Um, there needs to be some way to make change upward without having to have to persuade the lead that it is worth their time to invest in that outcome. Right, um, I agree with that. And so I think that that is something that we're going to have to work through is what does escalation look like? The, the path we decided we, we pursued was just go talk to whoever you need to talk to, which that's, that's, that makes great sense on paper. Um, but then when you try and uh, bring in the real world, you realize, well, I don't have a relationship with that person I need to talk to. And I don't know how to communicate my needs in a way that is going to be effective because I don't know how they're picking up on it. And then I don't know how they're going to respond. So maybe, maybe that person is my boss's boss. And I said something that I just sort of came across wrong. And now things are really awkward. Interesting. Um, and without roles, so my, 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 my initial thought was, well, you can just appeal to their roles. You can say, well, hey, as in your role as XYZ, I see you have an accountability for ABC. Would it make sense to you to help me with this? Because in my role as, you know, whatever, um, I'm feeling a tension around this thing. Like, what I've noticed about Holacracy, or at least using using like even even if you're just using role structure without Holacracy and without the evolutionary pieces, if you can go to someone and say, um, "I have this role, you have this role, we have a relationship between us," um, would it make sense to you based on your role to help me with this thing that like uh, that my role is having trouble with, and it, and that that can be a way to make it less personal. Uh that has a dependency on those uh, relationships and roles having been uh, established. Yes, totally. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we tried to get clear about was this concept of ghost roles that uh, you should be coming from a role, you should get clear about what you're doing. Um, but that was a hard sell uh, because um, it's it's a paradigm shift in order to uh, know how to use the tools that are exist in order to get clear about your roles and why they exist, you need to have a mental picture of how to take that step, and uh, that requires a lot of training and a lot of a lot of reinforcement, and um, 
if if that isn't present, if you don't have the proper leverage, then those people will do what is familiar to them and get work done instead. And unfortunately, if you prioritize getting work done over establishing your structure, uh, eventually it becomes a habit and yep. then those roles don't exist. Right. And, and probably it, it's already a habit not to work in roles. So you're actually working against people, people's yes. nature. The, the, when I think about, when I think about just using roles, that seems like really low hanging fruit in terms of the, the challenges that, you know, that exist. Um, and I'm like, I'm thinking like, oh man, they, if you couldn't even get, get like people to think in terms of roles, <laughs> you know, how are you going to get them to think in terms of, you know, caring for the organization and uh, all the other duties in the constitution processing, you know, priori priori prioritizing processing over project work. And um, it's, it's hard. Um, and, sort of what I've realized is that uh, it's, it requires continual maintenance. Oh, yeah. um, if, because, because our sort of our old thinking patterns always are fighting to get back out and people it, trying to figure out what leverage is available. So if somebody is choosing to, well, yes, I will, I will create a role for this. Uh, when it becomes a my priority, maybe that'll happen in three weeks or two months or four months. What, what reason do they have to prioritize that if they don't perceive it as valuable? Right. Yeah, it takes a little bit of, I, I don't know if this is necessarily true, but I've noticed for me, there's a little bit of a, like a playful curiosity and a, a, an interest in the work of building the organization's capacity and, and thinking about the organization as separate from me. Like that's something that helps me do some of that work. Um, that helps me think in terms of roles and, um, and it's kind of like the, you know, in the constitution, they talk about individual action and taking individual action and then being required to codify that in governance. And yeah, if you don't get that, if you're never trained for it, um, that's a, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if I would have done something differently, um, it would be to uh, really focus on, on uh, developing advanced practitioners and, and, and pulling people in and really focusing on the energy, the excitement um, and making it so that it's distributed. Um, so, I th well, the way we had it set up was fairly segregated where we had the holacracy uh, implementation circle and they were responsible for rolling this thing out and they had the coaches and the coaches were internal to that circle. Um, and then there was all the other circles that were being coached and those circles didn't have a lot of insight into uh, the, the experience that was made available by the holacracy circle because they were not present in the holacracy circle and the holacracy circle was not present in the day-to-day -day work of the circles that were doing the day-to-day -day work. And so there was a lot of uh, the, the best practices and real value and experts were sort of in different contexts. And so it, there wasn't a lot of good examples to watch. There was coaches, but we never really got to see the coaches uh, not coaching. <laughs> we we never got to see right. them using it they never we never got to see them eating their own dog food that's really interesting um what i'm thinking about right now is you know as i work with new clients um what i already what i always have in my head is how can we make this successful and what are the risks and how can i do it better next time and as you say it's a practice and there's, there's always opportunities to improve um if, and you just, you just kind of, you spoke to this a little bit, but like, yeah, if you could, um, if you could sort of, sort of give wisdom or warning to a new company that's about to start, like where, what would you say to, um, what would you say to a new company that was starting to, that, that was about to embark on a, on a holacracy transformation? Oh, that's a broad question. Um, and not even necessarily concretely, it can also just be like, the, the emotional impact or the, 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 the feeling of it, or. Um, I, I would say uh, 
get clear about what you hope to accomplish and then reiterate that every week, every month, like continue to reiterate what it is that you hope to accomplish with this 